Welcome to the Living to 100 Club podcast. Well, hello to everyone joining us today on our podcast. You're listening to one of our successful aging episodes this month on the Living to 100 Club program, and I am your host, Joe Casciani. Each program, our conversations educate and inspire, helping you get the best out of all the years we're given, regardless of what obstacles come our way. You can learn more about our club at our website. Be sure to take a look at my new training and activities manual, Better, Longer, and Happier, A Guide to Aging with Purpose and Positivity. This is a series of 12 modules in a card deck format developed for activities directors at senior living communities to learn more about psychologically healthy aging. Modules one through six are now on sale, so please visit the website livingto100.club forward slash BLH. Now, on to today's program. On today's podcast, our guest, Sarah Cart, shares the journey of her husband's acute medical illness and serious decline during COVID and the toll it took on her and her entire family. From kidney failure, hip fracture, and congestive heart failure to a heart transplant, cardiac rehabilitation, and recovery from painkillers, Sarah's husband, Ben, experienced an onslaught of hospitalizations, surgeries, and near-death experiences. Sarah recounts this journey in her new book, On My Way Back to You, One Couple's Journey Through Catastrophic Illness to healing and hope. We discuss our guest's unexpected role as caregiver, struggles with COVID lockdowns during the hospitalizations, learning the challenges of home health and other trying episodes. We also hear about the upsides to this struggle, the favorable responses to the medical care Ben had, and the positive lessons she can share about caring for other, with other caregivers. First, a little background. Sarah Cart was raised and educated in New York and New England and wrote for multiple local publications while she and her husband, Ben, raised four sons in Northeastern Ohio. Upon becoming empty nesters, the two moved to the Florida Keys, but they returned every summer to the Pennsylvania Poconos, where each had lifelong family connections. Then came COVID-19. The pandemic combined with Ben's health issues necessitated their sheltering in place in Florida for the entirety of 2020. In the wake of Ben's undergoing miraculous life-saving measures, they have been afforded the unanticipated gift of a future and more than ever before relish their time spent with family and friends. Sarah, welcome to our program today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh, you're most welcome. I always like to open by asking our guests to tell us about the journey that brought you here today. I guess that's that's why you wrote your book. You've been through a lot. <laughs> can you uh, can you give us a maybe a, a summary of how you are here today? Well, it's it's the overview is that Ben and I met in college, married raised our four sons and were living the dream, which in the thick of it, we called controlled chaos. Mm. And then in 2017, he was diagnosed with his autoimmune um, disease. We were told that it was incurable and all we would be able to do was treat the symptoms. So that's what we did, sometimes well and sometimes not. And it migrated from organ to organ. And with each new Mm. issue, we managed by fits and starts to catch up or keep up until he went into congestive heart failure and ended up with a pacemaker, which is when it all really became real and we understood we were in trouble. When the pacemaker couldn't keep up, we were told that his only hope was uh, for survival would be if he got a heart transplant. 
And whether or not he could get on the list was an open question because of the autoimmune. So when 2020 arrived, we were working on that, getting him on the list, and we were losing ground. Ben was obviously dying. He was in pain all the time. Our every conversation began with my asking, what hurts? How can I help? Mm. And we were doing a round of home IV antibiotics for infected wounds in his ankles. There was talk of amputation. He wasn't able to sleep. He was constantly exhausted. He was taking falls. He had no executive function. And then two weeks after the world shut down with COVID, his kidneys shut down too. And he ended up in the ICU at the Cleveland Clinic in Western Florida. Mm. COVID protocols meant he couldn't have any visitors and his status changed hour by hour. He made it onto the list, then he was off the list, then he was back on the list. Um, and he was about to go off the list again when we heard that a heart had been allocated, mm. which was a miracle. And then 10 days after that, they asked, has anyone mentioned this broken left hip? Um, and it happened during those one, was one of those falls before he'd gone into the hospital, but mm. he'd been so sick, nobody had figured it out while he was there. So we couldn't fix the hip until he was strong enough. And that meant that it would have to be after he came home. So he came home after eight weeks in the hospital and two weeks in cardiac rehab in a wheelchair. And because he'd been on oxycodone for the excruciating pain over the course of a month, he was by definition dependent. Um, we had a lot of support, but not right down in the trenches with us. Home healthcare was a cluster, um, both because of the way we live so far out of um, the mainstream and because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we had regular appointments with the doctors at the hospital. So I had to get them in and out of the car and all kinds of things that were challenging. Um, yeah. wow. but they were wonderful about putting us in touch with pain management counseling right away. And once he finally got his hip replaced, they helped us understand when it was best for him to use the oxycodone and then how to get him off of it. But six months post-transplant, he'd learned to walk again. He was getting stronger. I could finally believe he'd truly found his way back. And writing on my way back to you was a way to process all of that. Yeah. It's a, a life and death love story, which because of an extraordinary gift from a family that turned their tragedy into our miracle. Has hmm. that. That's quite an ordeal that you and he went through. How is he doing now? He's doing fabulously he takes mm. um upwards of 200 pills a week which he will do for the rest of his life mm. um but on occasion he annoys me and it's really wonderful wow yeah so i didn't read the title of our program but let me just put the spotlight on it. a heartfelt story of love caregiving and recovery so a lot of what ben went through was shared by you and the and your sons, of course. So was there anything that, um, it was so unexpected, this autoimmune condition, was there anything that triggered it? Do you have any idea that what brought it on? I have my suspicions. I mean, of course the doctors don't say anything definitive, but I think it was stress. Hmm. Um, ben has always been really easy, easygoing, a high energy guy. He's always believed that if you make something a priority, you'll be able to handle it. But 2015 was an economically challenging time for the company that he and his business partner, partner had founded 30 years earlier, and he was worried about his employees. And at the same time, his father, who was Ben's mother's primary caregiver, suddenly became ill and died within three months. So oh, wow. we were long distance arranging for 24 seven care for his mother and settling his father's estate that all landed on his shoulders. And once the autoimmune took root, it took a while for us and for others to accept that it needed to be our primary focus. I've said that the congested heart failure got our attention and the attention of our sons, but not until the doctors said heart transplant did mm -hmm. the extended family really begin to um, understand that we weren't just crying wolf. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, well, and the doctors never confirmed that or never definitively said that was no. the precipitating factor and it's hard i understand but, yeah it's i mean it's, yeah. it's it's they say it's not genetic um yeah. so yeah. we just take yeah. it symptom by symptom and day yeah, by sure. day and you could see the whole context i mean the, the, what was going on in ben's world and the stress and the business and 
his uh, his father. Uh, so a lot of challenging times. But um, were there others around to support you? Uh, you have four sons. Were there? Yeah, you know, our, our boys were amazing from yeah. the earliest diagnosis, um, even as none of us understood what it meant. Um, and once we started running the hurdles to get that on the list for transplant, they changed their schedules and visited frequently. We were all together in Northeast Pennsylvania um, for Thanksgiving in 2019. Mm. But then because of the pandemic, it was 18 months before we were all together again. Um, mm. Other people who were helpful in the thick of COVID, both while I was on my own and then once Ben came home, we were blessed by friends and family here, excuse me, friends and neighbors here, family was far away, but mm. food and gifts were left by the door um, and we were Zooming with everyone. Yeah. Um, my first Zoom call was actually the night Ben went to the hospital. It was yeah. a, a friend's mm. birthday on the West Coast and mm. I'd never heard of Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. And it's amazing to think what an amazing part of a daily yeah. part of yeah. our lives is now. Yeah, We Zoomed with our boys and other family and friends and women I'd gone to school with. My Ohio book group got back in touch with me, so I had yeah, them. Yeah. And so many people, everyone was going through something. Yeah. That makes such a big difference, I know. And uh, you learned Zoom soon enough, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So how, how did you cope or how did you learn what was needed to be the primary caregiver for Ben? What... I'm sure that you didn't get a chance to read a lot of books on caregiving. So how did you, how did you learn to take over? Um, it, it was little by little. A lot of it was on the fly. Um, but in the greater scheme of things, having watched my dad with my mom when she was dying, my sister when she was losing her husband, my brother's wife when my brother died, um, I, I knew some things about the grace and grit that would be required. Mm -hmm. Learning the frontline stuff was a lot of trial and error. Um, mm. the grace and patience from various uh, medical personnel who took time to teach me what I needed to know, a lot of which was via Zoom, um, and a lot of which I have since forgotten. Mm. Um, administering IV meds, nutrition, physical therapy, wound care. I made lots and lots of lists. Um, I wanted Ben back, so I did what had to be done at the moment mm. from managing his medications, including administering that IV um, to changing the dressings on a massive bed sore that needed to heal before he could be eligible for the hip replacement. In hindsight, it's kind of like having been pregnant and giving birth. I've since put a lot of the specifics out of mm. my mind. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So um, you learned along the way and you got a lot of help, of course, but were there times that were just so overwhelming for you and you just said, I don't know how much more. Yeah, the, kind of the worst was yeah the worst was trying to coordinate the visits from the home health care teams that were supposed to support us after he was discharged from the hospital and rehab. Um, until then, he'd had twenty four seven care from a whole team, and suddenly it was just me. And although various personnel were supposed to come in on a regular basis between COVID and um, communication snafu snafus and jurisdictional mix ups. I was on my own a lot more than than mm. we ever thought I would be. It was terrifying and challenging. Mm. The the weight of being the one person responsible for him was yeah. overwhelming. Did you begin to question whether it was too much for you? Um no, I what I there were moments where I would think what what was it that I said when I was standing at that altar all those years ago <laughs> in sickness and in health, <laughs> was there a time when I could have said no? And would I have said no? And I kept coming back to, you know, no, I would have, I would have still said yes, even, <laughs> even knowing where we landed. Sure. Yeah. Not what you wanted, but um, you wouldn't have it any other way as long as you were there to help. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Were you prepared for the possible death of your husband? As, as prepared as I could have been. I know so many people who are coming face to face with this kind of thing. Um, there's heartbreak, but you don't realize until you're in the thick of it that this is the kind of thing that can bring you closer as well and sure. what it means to treasure each day. Um, I said yes to various opportunities to be involved in different organizations so that if and when he died, I'd have places I needed to be so I couldn't mm. just be in the back of my closet with my thumb in my mouth. And mm. a lot of that was with Ben's encouragement. Mm. 
Can you share what some of those organizations were? Like um I'm I'm head of an, the art the largest social group here in our community. It's 500 people. Um so it was rising up through the ranks and and this winter I am the one in charge until May 1st. Hmm. Um another one is a women's fishing group. Uh -huh. Um the the club where we belong down here was on the board things like that mm, good good and i know um when you and i spoke earlier that you mentioned that ben had encouraged you to you know prepare for the worst and you know make sure you knew what to ask him about or what you know what preparations were needed or what uh, some of the details were and um, just kind of dealing with the reality of the potential realities. And um, what was that like for you as you were kind of preparing for that possibility? Not everybody is as lucky as we were um, in that we knew we had time to talk about things and what the mm. future would be. Mm. Even as I was caring for Ben, he was caring for me, helping me prepare for a time when we thought he wouldn't be there. Um, everything from practical lessons about plumbing and taxes and insurance to heavy conversations about how he wanted us to handle his remains and all of this stuff, which were tough conversations, but so meaningful um, mm. things that would help me power through losing him. Uh, was Ben the more or less the manager of the finances at home and insurance policies and business items like that? Or? That's how things had settled out over the course of uh -huh. The 35 years we'd been married to that sure. point, you know, I kind of yeah. took over Christmas presents and birthdays, yeah. Yeah. And took over all the desk work. Yeah. Um, okay. I managed the groceries and the food. It's just, that's just the way it, mm -hmm. it shook out. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, it kind of meant taking on some new responsibilities, new roles. Yeah. And, um, just in the eventuality that you needed to be more informed about it. But yeah, like you say, that was, I was fortunate because you had the time. You yeah, I ended up with a, a glossary in my computer so that I, a uh, word document where I could yeah. go look up things like I could yeah. look up the insurance policy by number and uh -huh. see what it was, you know the yeah. premiums were due things like that. That's what you need. That kind of organization goes a long way. Yeah, mm. I mean, he'd even told me when I would need to look into Medicare. So mm. <laughs> okay, so I know you wrote your book. A lot of it is devoted to kind of giving recommendations, tips, ideas, insights to other caregivers. What what kind of things can you share with our listeners that you know, you'd want to pass on to people who might be in similar situations? I think one of the most important things is to develop some sort of faith practice. Mm. It, it, it's a version of strength training. It doesn't have to be a church or a synagogue or a temple. It can be yoga or meditation or even breathing exercises. Um, something through which you find blessings and grace and grit because in the thick of the battle, you'll need somewhere to plant your feet so you can stand up strong. Mm -hmm. So, and What did you use? Um, I didn't grow up going to church, but we raised our family in the in the Episcopal Church. So mm -hmm. I had um, a lot of prayers in the back of my mind. Um, one was, um, you know, uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Even mm -hmm. even if it was a lousy day, the sun had risen. That was that was a mm -hmm. miracle to give thanks for, mm -hmm. and and try to move forward with that. Sure, sure. So. Other other ideas, other recommendations for people that maybe you know, facing heavy caregiving burden. Um, breathing exercises were huge. Breathing, uh -huh. and yeah. I, I, I tend to journal when I'm stressed, so I would journal and I would walk. But at night in the dark, all alone, you can't go out walking. Um, breathing out as much as I could as if my lungs were a sponge mm -hmm. and getting out as much. Mm -hmm. um, thinking of all the bad stuff, the, scape, the fear, the anger, the grief, those were all being squeezed out of my lungs. Mm -hmm. And then once my lungs were, you know, I need to breathe in, trying mm -hmm. to breathe in joy and gratitude and peace and grace and blessing and um, positivity and determination, um, fierceness mm -hmm. for the battle, and then exhaling again, all the bad stuff, squeezing mm -hmm. it out. 
usually it only took two or three times before I was mm -hmm. sound asleep again. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's a good recommendation just to be able to let go of a lot of that. And a lot of it is what's going on in our head. Of Yeah. course, the worry and catastrophizing, expecting the worst and let, letting go of some of that anxiety, some of that worry, because it doesn't do anything, even though it burdens us. So exhaling all of that with the thoughts and the emotions and then inhaling the positives, feeling the strengths, feeling the goodness, feeling the things that are going right. And I, I guess that that's an important thing to to learn, I think, because I, as a psychologist, I like to point out that it's so important to recognize there are still good things, no matter where we are, there are still Yeah. good things. And we don't, it's easy to lose sight of the good things. It's easy to put on that tunnel vision and only see what's wrong. So we really need to open up that perspective and see the bigger picture. Yeah, there are a lot of, there are plenty of things that are wrong, but let's find some of the good things, right? Let's find Right. some of the positives. Right. And, and another thing is um, share what's going on with people. Mm, sure. Um, I tried to be as open as I could. Um, and not sugarcoat stuff because I didn't want to ever have to take anything back. I didn't want to say, oh, he's going to be okay and have to say next that, oh, no, there's a, they're putting in a second pump or whatever it was, or they're reintubating him. Um, so just trying to make sure that everyone was on the same page. I also, when I, I sent out regular emails and those were actually ended up forming the outline of the book. I tried as hard as I could with each email to end on as positive a note or at least get my frame of mind into a positive frame of mind Mm -hmm. before Yeah. I hit send. Yeah. Yeah. I like that point about not sugarcoating. It's so easy to gloss over some of the heavy, heavy topic, heavy subject matter, but um, you can still be straight and not Right. be pulled into the negativity, but you can be straight about some of the wrong, some of the things that are not going so well, but also, as you say, ending it on some of the upsides. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't I didn't want to overwhelm people, but I also didn't want to suddenly have to overwhelm them because oh, I didn't mention this this and that were all going wrong. Yeah. So Yeah. So tell us about your book. How do you, I mean, I guess the emails form some of the outline, but Yeah. um, when did you decide to write it? And um, how did you Well, decide? it it was a way for me to process all that we had gone through. Um I, once Ben had passed the six month mark, um, and which should have been uh, the post transplant marker where we could be more social, um, but because of COVID vaccines, they were still being developed. So that wasn't a possibility. We were still isolated. Um, we were so happy to be together and I needed to get all of this on paper and, and, As I was processing it, it became obvious to me that Ben had taken the hero's journey. He'd, he'd had to come to terms with a, his declining health and a crisis. He'd had to leave home to venture forth and have this fantastic experience um, in, in the belly of the beast in the midst of the uh, pandemic. And then he returned home and had to adjust to the new person that he had become. Um, But the initial version of the manuscript was actually pretty raw, which is when I then worked with ghostwriter Glenn Plaskin, who helped smooth the rough edges and fill in some of my blind spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a long book. I have a copy here. I can put it up in front of the camera. I see you have it uh, behind you as well. Yeah. Um, it's a great book. It's it's not a quick read, uh, 300 pages, but um, I think it's so useful for readers, other people to learn what you went through and probably to identify with a lot of your, your frustrations, your struggles, your your successes. Yeah. Well, it might be good for insomnia too. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, you know, it's it, it's a it's a it's a therapeutic process too, right? For you Yeah, to absolutely. kind of unload and put a lot of that into writing. And you mentioned you were doing journaling as well along the way. Did you keep your journal write-ups? Or I've read where sometimes it's okay to write for thirty minutes and then tear it up or erase. Oh, it. no, I have, I have bound books. Yeah. Um, Okay. yeah. Okay. How It's, long it's would fascinating. you write? How Um, sometimes only, sometimes all I wrote was the date and, and my base heart rate, depending Mm. 
Okay. Things were really kind of crazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, if I really had a lot of unloading to do, maybe half an hour, but typically mm -hmm. five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and again, yeah. like the emails, I tried to get the, get the ugly stuff out and on paper and then pull myself up by my bootstraps and mm -hmm. tell myself, sure. hey, come on, yeah. let's do this. You, you can do this. Yeah. So. It lightened the load too, I'm sure, to get that out. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Just like the book. And the book is being uh, released this month. Is that right? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> April 2nd. Yeah. Well, that's today. That's yeah. today. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Yeah. But you were also a writer earlier in, in your career. Yeah. yeah I wrote, um, I'm really good at a 500 word arc. Uh, uh -huh. lifestyle stories for the local paper in Youngstown, Ohio, and then uh -huh. here where we are in, in Florida. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, okay, so again, the book is On My Way Back to You, One Couple's Journey Through Catastrophic Illness to Healing and Hope. Sarah, uh, some takeaways for our listeners, any points that you really want them to, to remember from this conversation? Everybody is going through something. Hmm. Um, treasure each day, which sounds like such a cliche, but really um, it comes back to that rejoice and be glad in it. There is always, always something for which to be grateful. And on that note, organ donation is an unbelievable gift. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that doesn't come up very often about, I mean, it's so important. I wonder why people are reluctant to agree to that. Yeah. It's part of um, accepting that we are not invincible, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. it's one of those hard conversations. Yeah. Well, of course, that's only the tissue. It's not our, our right. soul or our energy or our life, our spirit. Yeah. 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 So how can people buy a copy of the book? Um, it's available wherever books are sold. Okay. Um, if they don't have it on, in stock, they can order it for you. Available on Amazon, most likely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So just to recap um, those takeaways, everybody's going through something, treasure each day, and there's always something to be grateful for. And I also want to emphasize the, the point you made about sharing with others and not trying to carry the whole burden yourself and yeah. being willing to share. Not that you're asking people to take on your load, but it, it does ease the burden we're carrying when we can share what we're going through. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a little bit like like letting the pressure off yeah. the top of a propane tank. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being a guest on our program today. Um, I just want to remind my listeners to visit my website, living200.club. Sign up for my email list and download a free copy of my nine tips to make living longer enjoyable. And if you're affiliated with a senior living setting, be sure to look for our new training manual, Better, Longer, and Happier. Sarah, thanks again for being a guest on our program, and uh, good luck to you with the book sales. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. I really appreciate being here today. Oh, great. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you. 